Well, hello, Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. here, back in my office, and I'm here to say that in times like these, we need an anchor. In times like these, we need a savior. Be very sure. My friends, be very sure that your anchor holds and it grips the solid rock. That rock is Jesus. He's the one. The rock is Jesus, and he's the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. My friends, I tell you, I'm excited because my anchor holds in the storm of life when uh, uh, trouble comes and when the devil comes and when we're beneath the strife of this wicked world, I'm glad to, to be able to say that Jesus is my anchor and he keeps my soul. I pray that you're having a good day. I'm just coming to you with my weekly invite for you to come. And I love the sound of this. I'm inviting you to meet me here tonight at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ for Bible study. I'm so excited about the word of the Lord. And tonight I'm going to, uh, last Sunday, last Sunday, I preached about, I preached a message entitled, The Courageous Deborah. You know, that powerful woman of God who was, who was one of the 13 persons who judged Israel. What made her unique is that she's the only woman, only female who was a judge. And I want you to know, she was a awesome, outstanding leader indeed. And I said Sunday, and I'll say, say it again today, there's a whole lot that we, even we men, can learn from Deborah. There's a whole lot. She was, she was feminine. She was beautiful. She was married. She was a mother. She was an awesome woman. And let me tell you, she was an awesome leader. And her, there's so much that we can learn, even in how to handle this COVID-19 crisis that we're in. I, my friends, I'll tell you, I don't know. Uh, I'll tell you, I think Deborah had more, more man in her than many of our men today because she she got the ball to rolling and God used her to bring about great victory. And one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight in our study of this great, great woman of God, I want to talk to you tonight about application. At what point do we apply the scriptures? I mean, we've read about Daniel in the lion's den. We've read about the three Hebrew boys. We've read stories uh, in the Bible. Stories are replete with God's people standing in the midst of trials, storms, uh, pandemics, epidemics, uh, the uh, enemy invasions, you name it. And how the people stood on the word of God, applied what they had been uh, uh, taught. The Bible says, Paul said, uh, they that run in a race, run all. He teach that they train, they prepare to run. And, and when the time comes to, to uh, participate in the contest, they get a chance to, to exercise what they've been training. And you know, my friends, this is true, whether it's boxing, uh, the martial arts, or whatever it may be, football. People don't just practice just to practice. They practice so that they can execute in the game. The whole, the whole point of practicing, the whole point of learning is execution when reality faces you. That you, you practice and you work until the thing becomes second nature to you. And then when the battle is on, Bam! You kick in uh, to action that which you have been practicing all the time. Well, I don't know of any churches that uh, that have been practicing, and perhaps they have. Perhaps they have. Well, maybe uh, maybe I shouldn't say what I was going to say. I was going to say I don't know of churches that have been practicing closing down, even when they can be open. But, you know, the trend has been going that way for some time. Uh, there are churches, even in this area, who draw people. Their, their greatest drawing card is uh, short services, the brevity of service. I've said before, 
you, one, I never thought that brevity of time with God would be a drawing card to people. And yet we're living in that day where tr- pastors use as a tool to, to attract people, a hook to get them in. We promise you that, we, that, that the service won't last long. And people love that stuff. Well, now uh, there are people falling in love with preachers who are promising uh, that due to the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, we won't have service at all, even in places that are not hot spots, even in places where there's no uh, stay at home order, where the governor or the people who are in charge are saying that you can't have service. Uh, uh, there are preachers and churches today that have just opted, opted to keep their doors closed. I want to say this to you, pastors. You have the authority to keep your members from attending your church. All you got to do is close your church doors. But don't you think for a minute that just because you have closed the doors of your church where they can't attend the church that you pastor and perhaps they're a member there, don't you think for one minute that that means that they're staying home? All you got to do is turn on the television. They're at the mall. They're at the beach. They're where people congregate. They, they, people are out. People are out. People are out. And it seems to me that the only business where people are allowed to come back to, the only business who are saying to their crowd uh, that even though the people are allowed to come back to, the, the only business, I keep saying it, that are saying don't come is the church. Well, tonight, my friends, we're going to gather. We're going to social distance. We're going to be smart. We'll have the doors open for you. Security is in place. All of the things that we uh, practice to keep us all safe that has worked thus far, we will have those things in place tonight. And we're going to have church. I want you to come because I tell you, the word of the Lord is going to bless you real good. I'm excited about even the thought of of being together live in the sanctuary. And for those wonderful members who still you don't feel comfortable yet, you have you have good reasons to stay home. You have underlining health issues. You have various things. Or you just right now, Pastor, I love you. I love God, but I'm just not quite ready yet. Hey, we will be on YouTube live. We will be on Facebook live. Uh, and, uh, and, and the word of God will be uh, coming to you and we want you to take the word in and be blessed of the word of God. But I'm excited about tonight. Now we got to pray for our nation. We got to pray for our nation. We got to pray for our nation. You see what's happening in Minnesota. Oh my, here we go again. There's a wickedness in our land that has to be addressed. How do you keep your knee on a man's neck when the man is begging you saying, sir, please, please, sir, I can't breathe. Please, please. The man is handcuffed. There's four officers there. How do you stand around the other three and watch a man put his knee on an officer's neck on a human being's neck like that. Uh, whole, I'm not saying to control him because you had him under control once you had him handcuffed. And I've talked to members of the law enforcement community here in Raleigh who has told me, told me personally that that maneuver is not one that's a part according to their manual and training. And yet here we are again uh, facing another senseless death Uh, to me, a murder, praise the Lord. Now I'm not judge, jury, and executioner. Somebody need to tell that police officer that he wasn't, he's not either. But oh, my friends, oh, my friends, we need to pray about these things. And then the response, the reaction to it, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, you're never wise to loot stores. You're never wise to get out in the streets and to uh, uh, participate in a mob crowd like that. Two wrongs don't make a right. You don't get justice for 
uh, someone by robbing or looting or, or, or pillaging someone else's property who had nothing to do with the injustice that was done the, uh, to uh, the gentleman there in Minnesota. So we need prayer. We need prayer. Those who wear the uniform to serve and protect and thank God that the overwhelming majority of them do. I pray we're praying for you, but you got you. You, you have to admit you have to admit uh, Brother Gary. They took the dog from the lady the other day. That was a lady uh, in the park. I think she was in uh, Washington, in New York, uh, Central Park, walking the dog. But she was walking in a part of the park. Well, the dog is supposed to be kept on a leash. She saw a black guy who's a bird watcher. Uh, and the guy said, I think I got the facts right. I know he said to her, lady, put your dog on a leash. You know what she did? She, she made a phone call. She pretended that the black guy was uh, attacking her because she knew, being white, that when all else fell, you pull out the old blame it on the black guy trick. And you call and, and say, police, come, come, this black man is hurting me. He's, he's, he's attacking me. Uh, but, but she was too dumb to notice that he was filming her. <laughs> so my point is this. When the police come, she loses her job. But here's the thing, Garrett. You know what they did? They noticed that while she was trying to uh, frame the black man, she was holding her dog on the leash too tight. The dog was whimpering on the leash. The dog was uncomfortable on the leash. And they took the dog from her because the dog couldn't breathe. Two or three days later, we see a black man on the ground saying, I can't breathe. Please, officer, I can't breathe. And the man, the man, the officer, the judge, jury, and executioner pays no attention whatsoever to the cries of that man. In regards to what happened, I, I you know, I know what I know what, what what we're saying. Well, you don't know what the videotape didn't show. That is so true. But Law enforcement would tell you, I was watching Dan Bongino on, uh, I think it was Fox News today. He said once an assailant, he used to serve in the New York Police Department, and I got to wrap this up, and he also was Secret Service. He said once an assailant is handcuffed and you have them under control, that ends the contest. There's no need to, for further uh, uh, restraint because you got them. So what? where did the knee come in at? Oh, my friends, this troubles me greatly. We're going to pray about it tonight. We're going to pray for our nation. We're going to pray for our nation. We need prayer. We need prayer. We need prayer. I tell you what we need. We need revival. We need to turn to Jesus and, the, and let the Lord set us free and deliver us from this scourge of abortion. But this preacher said years ago that when America would get comfortable snuffing out the lives of a million babies per year and we could sleep on it and it wouldn't bother us that it would in fact cheapen all human life and we see this taking place all right we're going to study the word of God together tonight and I want you to join me right here at the upper room church of God in Christ for Bible study. Yep, Bible study. We're going to study the word of the Lord together. God bless.